Good evening. Let's call this meeting to order at 7.24 p.m. We apologize for our delay. Thank you all for your patience and engagement this evening. Here. 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 And next we'll move on to our land acknowledgement. We take time to acknowledge the land we meet on is the traditional homelands of the Council of Three Fires, the Potawatomi, the Ojibwe, and the Ottawa. This land also served as an important meeting place for the Miami, Ho-Chunk, the Menominee, Anoka, Sac, Fox, Peoria, Arapaho, Cheyenne, and other tribal nations. This land has long been a center for indigenous people to gather, trade, and maintain kinship ties. Located at the intersection of several great waterways, the region has become the site of travel and prosperity. We acknowledge Evanston and John Evans are tied to the massacre of the Arapaho and Cheyenne for railroad, railroads and westward expansion, upon which John Evans developed his wealth and founded Evanston. This land was violently taken under settler colonialism through genocide and open warfare. And the region that is now Illinois and Chicagoland is still home to thousands of Native people who are actively struggling for sovereignty, self-determination, and justice. The genocidal acts of settler colonialism extended to peoples of African, Africa and their enslaved descendants. Despite Illinois eventually prohibiting slavery, slavery was an accepted practice before and after statehood. The vestiges of slavery remain present throughout the United States and directly affect the descendants of enslaved peoples. Descendants who helped define the African diaspora, rich and heterogeneous communities descended from African people. The genocidal patterns of violence against peoples of Africa, African descent and indigenous people who have been or have been replicated to exclude and harm people from many intersecting marginalized identities, religious minoritized, disabled, and LGBTQ identified peoples, black and indigenous people of color, and people of color writ large in the United States. These patterns of violence demonstrate that the pursuit to end state-sanctioned violence against black and indigenous people of color is a daily struggle for liberation from continued social, political, and economic anti-black racism and oppression. Today, we acknowledge that we are living, breathing, loving, grieving, laughing, and sharing space on unceded territory. May we learn to honor the historical and contemporary presence and power of the people and their belief that we must be caretakers of the lands and waters for the livelihood of future generations. The land that surround us, surrounds us is part of who we are. It reflects our histories. It is within District 65's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about black and indigenous peoples and marginalized peoples writ large, consistent with our commitment to equity. We will work towards sharing truth and promoting healing for the sake of all of our children and our families. It is important to understand the longstanding history that has brought us to reside on the land and to seek to understand our place within that history. Land acknowledgements do not exist in the past tense or only in a historical context. Colonialism is a current and ongoing process. And we need to understand our present participation. We encourage everyone consuming this message to continue expanding their knowledge and reduce their harm through awareness of local mutual aid models for survival, 
and engagement with online and local resources, such as the Chicago American Indian Community Collaborative and the Shorefront Legacy Center. I move that the Board of Education approve the meeting agenda as presented. Second. Second. Yes. 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 So next we'll move on to our district update. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, board and community. Can't believe it's January 31st. We are wrapping up the first month of, the, of 2022. And this was nothing short of um, a lot of action on all of us in, in our district. I want to thank our students and our teachers again for their commitment to, uh, you know, to be resilient and fight through the situations regarding COVID, uh, continue to stay engaged in the teaching and also engaging in the learning uh, with support of our families and parents at home. I would also like to say we are launching, we have a lot on our plate over the next few months and I just want to remind everyone how important it is that we stay in tune with the action that's coming. Because uh, it'll go by fast, but it's heavy. We've had some successful student assignment planning community members. We've had now six of them, to be exact, one with staff and the other five with the community. Got some amazing feedback regarding that. Um, we've launched, uh, we'll be launching our Black Lives Matter Week curriculum as a, it's a, it's a, uh, a hallmark of our community, and we've just launched that. So please stay tuned. We sent out information last week regarding the, the changes potentially, and also just information that's important for our families to be able to engage with their children at home. I would also, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that our COVID mitigation efforts, while not perfect, have, and in, in, in my honest opinion, and from what we're seeing, what our support in our schools have been really successful overall, if you had to, you know, rate a success rate. Um, I want to thank our building leaders. They've taken on roles that when they're working on weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, calling families for contact tracing. That's a lot to ask of them and to commit to. Um, our families for being involved and being very cooperative when contact tracing and some of the QRC placement, uh, it's, not, it's not desirable, but our families have been really supportive and we thank you for that. Um, and also the custodian and maintenance team. Um, I'm getting more communication than I've seen in a long time with uh, the cleanliness of buildings. We're improving. We got a lot more work to do. So I don't think I'm saying we're there yet, but uh, that's been going really well for us. And uh, Mr. Bronson, we want to thank you for your efforts to, uh, to work to improve that. Uh, there's still work to do, sir, but we're working on it. Um, thanking that team. But again, what's really important is that everyone stay, pay attention and stay connected. The student assignment planning is still happening. Um, that's, it's hot and heavy. Uh, it's intense, and I thank Sarita Smith for leading that uh, with the support of Dr. Green and, and her team and other members. The master facility planning is taking off. We're presenting next month uh, on the 14th. That is going to be a barn burner. I've been looking at the presentation and the data, and it is overwhelming. So if, for those of uh, my data people, when you get this report, <laughs> just get you, you know, just be prepared to spend a lot of time. It's, it's so interesting. Uh, that's all I can say. Um, and then we have the big one, the strategic planning, which is taking place. And uh, it's been very um, interesting, again, with the data that we've been able to collect, the involvement. And all three of those, that, all of the three of those entities are very connected. But we want to be sure that you know that there's student assignment planning, <laughs> master facility, and strategic planning. Yes, we're taking that all on. Um, and we know that we, this is enough work for the next five to seven years. So um, I wanted to just continue to remind everyone. So thank you for that. And school board, I uh, appreciate all of all that you're doing regarding communicating, uh, student assignment planning, expectations, uh, and the other things as we're having our committee meetings. I'm excited that we're able to have those committee meetings and go into deeper conversations about the around the unique things that's currently taking place in our district. So thank you for that. Well, let's almost, all right. Now let's get to the fun. Um, January High Five. Tonight we're celebrating two members of our staff selected as award recipients for January as part of our High Five, celebrating excellence in District 65 recognition program. Now it's in its fifth year. We have received hundreds of nominations and honored over 80 licensed and support staff members for their tremendous work. Nominations are accepted through the school year from staff and members of the D65 community 
and forms are available on our website at district65.net slash high five. On behalf of our district, I would like to thank Byline Bank for its continued support and sponsorship of the program. This evening's recipients will receive a $100 gift card and a frame recognition certificate. I am now going to turn it over to Melissa Messenger, our Director of Communications, who will help with our recognition this evening. Melissa, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Horton. Yes, this is always a very uplifting part of our meeting. Um, and tonight we're going to recognize Mrs. Elizabeth Nelson and Mr. Stan Morrow. Um, I think both are here with us tonight. Yes. No? <laughs> um, so, well, first we're going to recognize uh, Elizabeth Nelson. Are you here? Um, so, unfortunately, was not able to join us tonight, but she's a third grade teacher at Walker Elementary and has served our students and families for seven years. She was nominated by a family member, Annie Millman, who also could not be here tonight, but said, Ms. Nelson has gone above and beyond for our two children during the past two years of COVID. She engages children in such creative, unique ways and does so much to create a strong sense of community among the students. Ms. Nelson went so far as to bring my children their devices right to our house so they could participate on the day of e-learning in January. Both of my children have been so fortunate to have her as their third grade teacher. Um, so next up, we're gonna recognize our educational support staff recipient, Stan Morrow. Are you here? Um, so he's a special education teaching assistant, volleyball coach and basketball coach at Bessie Rhodes who has supported students in our community for four years. He was also nominated by a D65 family member, Phoebe Valdez, who shared, last fall, Mr. Morrow coached girls basketball at Bessie Rhodes. He did an amazing job coaching a team of over 30 girls. He pushes them to achieve their goals and is always motivating. He is currently coaching the girls basketball team and is not only supportive on the court, but he genuinely cares about helping the players with academic engagement as well. I am so grateful for all he does for my daughter and the entire team. Um, so thank you both, Stan and Elizabeth. Um, unfortunately, they were not able to join us this evening. Must be preparing for the winter weather we're going to get later this week. Um, but we'll make sure that both of them get their certificates and gift cards. So thank you. If we could give them all still a round of applause, please. We also would like to recognize um, some our t educators tonight, our teachers, uh, who have received a national board certification. Uh, I don't think they're in attendance tonight, but I would just like to recognize uh, we have Jessica Consiglio, Jennifer Dow, Brittany Noble, Elise, and Elise Stoll. That is quite an accomplishment. National Board certification is a lot of work, is well respected, and it's a detriment. And it's, it, it shows the value that those educators really have in committing themselves to this work. So thank them and congratulations. Let's give them a hand. That's especially exceptional given that two of those were renewals. Uh, next on our agenda is public comments. Uh, members of the public are welcome and invited to address the board during open public meetings. Speakers are discouraged from using the public comment period to air specific concerns about staff members, being mindful that public comment period is not a suitable forum for fact finding or resolution of disputes. Rather, we encourage members of the public who have concerns about specific district employees to follow the district communication guidelines found in the student handbook. Please remember to state your name and that you have three minutes to address the board. Also note that it is not customary for the board to respond to public comments. The best way to correspond with members of the board is by emailing schoolboard at district65.net. Hello, 
Hello, my name is Julie Schatz. I'd like to start off by thanking you all for all the updating of policies that you've, you've done as we've learned more about COVID-19 since early 2020. Specifically, thank you for prioritizing in-person learning during the Omicron surge in particular. Thank you for beginning the test to stay program which can keep healthy exposed students in school. I'm thankful for the vaccine clinics that the district held multiple times that so many people benefited from, including my own kindergartner and third, third grader in the district. Thank you for decreasing quarantine and isolation times from 10 to five days when the CDC and ISBE guidance changed them. Now it is time to update another outdated policy. Currently at District 65 school buildings, children and staff are required to wear masks while outside during recess. Also, parents and guardians are required to wear masks at arrival and dismissal. As we have learned, being outside essentially eliminates the risk of potential SARS-CoV-2 transmission. The science tells us that the virus particles disperse effectively in outside air, deactivated by ultraviolet radiation, heat, and humidity. Most experts believe the actual risk of outdoor transmission is likely less than 1%. Studies have shown that even on days when it's not windy, outdoor ventilation is over 100 times better than inside an office building and over 1,000 times better than inside most homes. In April of 2021, Dr. Fauci said, quote, the risk of spreading COVID-19 is really very low in the fresh air. I think it's pretty common sense now that outdoor risk is really, really quite low. Evanston is one of the most highly vaccinated places in the country. According to data released on January 27th, 95.9% .9 of residents five and older have received at least one dose of the vaccine and 85.6% are fully vaccinated. So the risk of outdoor transmission during recess at Evanston schools is minuscule. The Evanston Department of Health and Public Human Services, sorry, the Department of Health and Human Services does not recommend mask wearing outside, nor does the Illinois State Board of Education, the Illinois Department of Public Health, nor the CDC. We should not be ma making stricter rules than what these public health entities have been recommending for months. At the nearby public school district where I work, masks have been optional outside for the entire school year with great success. Knowing outside time can be mask free has been appreciated by many young and old, including staff members like me who help out with lunch and recess supervision. It's a joy to see the children smiling and laughing. They can forget about masks while they play freely, communicate more easily with each other, get a break from, the, from their, their ears holding up those masks all day. Parents who don't feel comfortable with their children taking masks off outside have their children continue to wear them. It's no big deal, everyone wins. And contact tracers have never asked about who was with whom on the playground because of the aforementioned low risk of outdoor transmission, it just doesn't matter. Getting 25 minutes to breathe the fresh air outside, to see each other's smiles and laughs and to communicate more effectively are all normal things that could be easily and safely given to the children of District 65. The District 65 outdoor masking policy, which impacts every single child in the district, remains outdated and unscientific. I'm afraid that decisions about our children's well-being are being made based not on scientific reasoning, but to appease adult anxieties and fears. With the plummeting COVID case numbers in particular in our community, including only two positive cases reported at my children's school last week, now would be the perfect time to make a risk, a small risk-free step toward normal. Thank you so much for considering. <clears throat> Hello, board. <laughs> My name is Nina Todorovich, and I'm a mother of three here in the community. I have a fourth grader and second grader at Washington, and I have a two-year-old who's starting preschool. Um, first, I want to thank you all so much for your continued service with the D65 community. My kids are so happy to be back in person this year. We are also very pleased with how organized the remote learning situation was when we came down with COVID after the break. The QRC was seamless and it provided well needed structure during our quarantine. On the contrary, I recently read through our school newsletter and I was disheartened when I read that our school will continue to enforce masking except at lunch. I feel that the most up to date information coming out around masking demonstrates that we are doing more harm than good to require it at school. I understand that you have to abide by the state's mandate for indoor masking. However, I believe our district still has the ability to allow kids a well-needed and well-deserved mask break at outdoor recess, PE, during drop-off and pickup. Masking is not recommended by the CDC in outdoor settings. Per the CDC website, in general, people do not need to wear masks when outdoors. 
I know that the argument would be that kids may not be able to social distance in these activities. However, outdoors, per the CDC, is the safest place to be without a mask, and the benefit of taking these mask breaks far outweighs the minimal risks. I say minimal because one, our community has an exceedingly high vaccination rate, both in children and adults, and two, kids are at the lowest risk of contracting serious illness from COVID, even without vaccination. After two years of strict masking measures, the time is now to give our children the benefit of a more relaxed mitigation measures. Here's my question to the school board. What do you think is normal for our children? Is it normal to have their faces covered six plus hours a day, every day at school? Is it normal to only know their teachers and peers by their eyes and not their full facial expression? Is it normal not to have any physical human contact and always be fearful of coming closer than a yardstick to a classmate? We have to agree on what we want normal to be. Right now, the normal that our children experience on a daily basis is stoked in fear and creates isolation, anxiety, physical and behavioral issues that are getting worse the longer we subject them to it. We cannot believe that we are, for, are <clears throat> forcing them, what, that what we are forcing them to do isn't having a long-term psychological impact. At this point, anyone in our community who wants to be vaccinated has had the choice to do so, including boosters. Evanston can be proud to have one of the highest vaccination rates in the country, both adults and children. Teachers and staff are safer than ever. Omicron, while more contagious, is also known to be milder. So universal, harsher mitigation measures just don't make sense at this point. I understand that many families in our community are strongly in favor of masking. If they feel better having their child wear a mask for whatever reason, then they should be allowed to do so. However, for those of us who are ready to move on, the right policy decision at this point is to make masking outdoors at school optional. I want my children to breathe better, speak better, see other children's faces, laugh, play, and not feel the constant anxiety Thank that you. comes from making sure their mask is on all the time. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. to make sure that I made a couple of board comments and my colleagues may have some as well. Um, I'd like to say Gung Hai Fat Choi, Happy Year of the Tiger to everyone who is celebrating Lunar New Year, um, including my family. And I also want to note that tomorrow marks the beginning of Black History Month. So, a best wishes for a happy and prosperous Year of the Tiger and Black History Month. Like the water tiger, in 2022, may we be strong, may we be brave, and may we be just. And I'll add a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King since we also celebrated MLK Day this month. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Do we have any additional comments from the board? Okay, thank you. And so we'll move on to item seven on our agenda. Okay. Uh, I move that the Board of Education accept the recommendations outlined in the attached group motion and approve the personnel appointments, leaves, and separations, resolution to authorize notice of remedy of licensed employee, Resolution for the dismissal of an educational support staff. December 2021 Board of Education and Committee meeting minutes. Amended policy 6135 uh, on accelerated learning. Destruction of November 20, 2019 closed session meeting minutes and recordings. November 2021 list of bills. October 2021 treasurer's, treasurer's report and budget amendment and the December 2021 contracts for $25,000 and above. Second. Tony? Yes. Thank you, Ryan. Yes. Patterson? Yes. Hernandez? Yes. Walter? Yes. Honeybee? Yes. 
I move that the Board of Education ratify the contract with the Evanston Custodial Maintenance Association as presented. Second. Second. Okay. Yes. Linda Bryant. Yes. Weatherspoon. Yes. Hernandez. Yes. Faulkner. Yes. Takaguchi. Yes. Motion passes six zero. I move that the Board of Education approve the 2022 summer student learning proposal presented. Second. Did anyone have any questions? <coughs> this was presented at our curriculum and policy committee and was in the packet for review. Did anybody have any additional comments or questions? We can uh, call the vote. Ken? Yes. Linda Bryant? Yes. Yes. Hernandez? Yes. Felton? Yes. Taniguchi? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. This is the approval of the school calendar for 2022, 2023, and 2023 24. I move that the Board of Education approve the school calendar for school year 2022, 2023, and school year 2023, 2024 as presented. Second. We had some questions about this item. Um, I wanted to give us the opportunity to share those with the public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, uh, notably there's a, a break in the fall, a full week at the week of uh, the holiday break there. Um, so that's a big change. Um, let me pull up my question. I think there was a question about the way uh, winter break falls. It falls. Yep. Right so, here. and we, we experienced this this year where the, the winter recess jutted up right, right against, I think it was Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, my question was looking at the, the proposed calendar, we have, we would have school on December 23rd, which is a Friday. Christmas Eve is Saturday the 24th. Um, <coughs> If we were to shift a week earlier, then we'd have the same issue on the back end where New Year's Day, January 1st is a Sunday and then we return to school. So I was, my question is, uh, was any thought by the committee given to adding a day? To the end of the school year? To the end of the school year and giving a day to families on the 23rd so that people that are traveling or whatnot can do so the day before the holiday so we don't have I, I, imagine, I imagine a lot of people, or do we have information this year about people getting out of Dodge because that's when traveling can happen so they can be out for the holiday and is it worth just having a day off uh, to plan for that, knowing that this is something that happens every seven years? Yeah, this, um, we didn't, that part didn't come up, but I know it was really important uh, for the board to first to have alignment with 202. So that's what really drove that, that, t that date for us to get out. So um, they're in school on the 23rd. Yeah, they are. Yep. Yep. That's the one of, that's really the main reason we did it. Um, but I also say this, what was really, well, you're not, you didn't ask that part, but I'll just say what I think what really helped us to uh, keep, to keep mitigations a little bit under control when we return from January is that we had that week gap from New yeah. Year's and that was really helpful mm -hmm. um, for us regarding, you know, getting tested and things like that. The memo also references, um, it's the second bullet of the first series of bullets. In lieu of the October half day, we will now look to host a full, a full day school improvement day, October 12th and October 4th respectively. When I look at the calendar, is it that October 12th is on 22, 23 yeah. and the other one's the following year? Oh yes, yeah. okay, yeah. 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 Okay. Great. So that's, that's user error on my part. Um, my last question and then I'm done with calendar questions is about the logistics of talking to stakeholders about the, the group. When we talk about the calendar committee, I understand that all of our bargaining units have people on the committee. Do we have buildings represented as well or just bargaining staff bargaining units? We don't have all of our buildings represented, but we do have between our bargaining units, the uh, school administrators on the committee and the parents on the committee, we do have a good cross representation of elementary, middle, magnet schools across the district, but there are not 18 representatives from each building. 
Got it. Thank you. Yeah. And I think the only other question I had, which I think has been answered, but it might be helpful to illuminate for the public, that in the 23-24 school year, Rosh Hashanah falls on a weekend, and the way that it is observed does not require a day off. So you might see not having a day off for Rosh Hashanah in 23-24, but that is not because there's any change in, in terms of our observance of holidays. That's it's just the way it falls. Sundown on a Friday isn't impacted by school. Correct. So just making sure that's clarified for anyone else who sees it and might be concerned. to just highlight again that um, sorry my touch screen is having some issues <laughs> but again that um, Veterans Day will be in Attendance Day and in in alignment with the state statute we will be sharing information about Veterans Day on that instructional day Yes, there are, uh, Stacy gave some data to us that's pretty, um, you know, when you think about teaching and learning, it, how many four-day weeks we have within the cycle. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to really try to do our best to alleviate as many, as, have less of those of, as, that we possibly can, which allowed us to uh, really look at that Thanksgiving week and give that time together so families can do the traveling and, you know, have our educators be able to, you know, just check out right before Thanksgiving, so. Yeah. For the fall break. For the fall break. Yeah, for the fall break. Yeah, no Thanksgiving, fall break. <laughs> um, also, just to add to that, too, is that same week, November 8th, is Election Day, and in 2022, that is a state holiday for all employees and requires school to be closed. So that's on November 8th, which is on Tuesday. Veterans Day falls on Friday, so... Again, that would be a very challenging week with, with both of those days as well. So um, just a reminder for our community, November 8th it will be a non-attendance day. There is not a general election in 2023, so we will not have an election day on the calendar in 2023. But you may see it again in 2024. Thank you. Are there any discrepancies from 202 in here that weren't able to be worked out? I mean, our, our half days on Wednesdays are not in alignment with them. No, we've actually had a lot of coordination with the high school on our calendar this year. We had a representative on our calendar committee, um, and we spent time just reviewing the calendars together. I would say discrepancies are as they are in a typical school year, so ETHS is starting earlier than we do, which has been their historical practice for the past few years. Um, our professional learning dates are not aligned, as you just referenced. Um, and also, they are observing Veterans Day. So that is the only holiday where we're not aligned. But in terms of the uh, Jewish holy days, winter break, uh, spring recess, um, we're pretty much aligned throughout the rest of the school year. And our contract does not allow us to start before August 20th. So starting August earlier 20th. is not an option for consideration. Correct. Yeah, that would have to be bargained with the District Educators Council. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that we are set to call the vote for the item. Adams. Yes. Lindsay Ryan. Yes. Weatherspoon. Yes. Hernandez. Yes. Colson. Yes. Tanya Booty. Yes. The next item on our agenda is the early childhood report. And we have a presentation from Karen Grace Brock Hout Brockman. Can you hear me through my mask? It's yes. good? Yes, All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm really happy. I'm Dr. Sharon Sprague, for anybody who doesn't know me, and I'm the director of early 
child care program for the district, and I run JEH Early Childhood Center. Okay. Um, I'm happy to be here to update the board and the community on JEH's progress towards achieving the goals of our strategic plan. Um, sorry, I got to click in two directions here. Uh, we are in year three of our strategic plan, created in fall winter of 2019 and adopted and introduced on April 22nd, 2019. The plan was put fully into action in sc during school year 20 and full completion of the goals will be assessed next fall based on the BOY or beginning of the year map assessment performance of this year's graduating class of school year 2022. Tonight I will share with you updates on the six goals of the strategic plan and how we have fared towards achieving those goals over the past 2.5 years while navigating a global pandemic. As we get started, I just wanted to remind everyone of the unique demographics of our Early Childhood Center. All students at JEH must demonstrate risk factors for future academic success in one or more criteria in order to be selected for admission to our grant-funded or special education program. As we are the only school in the district serving this age group, we have a larger than typical distribution of students receiving special education services. The percentage of students in our school with IEPs is as follows. Um, in school year 2019, we were 24% of the population receiving special education services. School year 1920, 33%. School year 2021, 34%. And school year 2022, our current year, we are at 33% and climbing. Additionally, this year, about two-thirds of our students are eligible for free and or reduced lunch, and all Head Start students meet for free and reduced lunch requirements. Um, and to remind you, uh, these are the six overarching goals of our strategic plan. Ensure JEH Center is well organized for continuous improvement, create a culture in which teaching and learning is driven by diversity, equity, and inclusion, Create a climate in which students' social-emotional developmental needs are addressed and supported. Ensure that all children are individually prepared for kindergarten. Strengthen family and community partnerships to support learning opportunities. And finally, align resources with goals to ensure student success. This is what we've been able to do to support strategic plan goal one. We have built and maintained strong and effective leadership systems. We restructured the administrative team two years ago to better support instructional leadership. Prior to that, the structure had been designed to support grant compliance issues. We have worked to develop a, develop a school-wide understanding of the importance of collaborative practice in school improvement. We have done this through the examination of research and the regular thorough examination, I'm sorry, collection of data followed by review and analysis of these data to inform instruction. We have also implemented and maintained common planning time for our teacher co cohorts to regularly meet, engage in professional learning communities, work on MTSS problem solving, planning for instruction, and progress monitoring. Additionally, we have worked to increase family involvement, which I will go over when we get to goal five. This chart, it's a little hard to read, but uh, this chart shows our school's performance on the five essential survey over time. The five essential survey is used to rate how well a school is organized to support continuous improvement. To remind everyone in early childhood, we are only able to collect data on three out of the five essentials because our students are too young to participate in the survey and two of the essentials require student input. The areas we are able to get feedback on are effective leaders, collaborative teachers, and involved families. In all three areas, we have shown growth over the past two years, though one can see a clear implementation dip in the first year of implementation. But we are, we're happy to see a steady, steady growth in year two, and we are hoping for more improvement this year. Um, in the three areas of the five E's we are able to measure, we are now performing on, about on average with the rest of the district. 
So the gray bands represent District 65 performance on the five E's and the blue bands represent the uh, JEH performance. We are most proud of the progress we are making in the area of collaborative teaching. This graph also compares the outcomes, our outcomes to the rest of the district. These data include responses from our teachers and all of our teaching assistants and paraprofessionals. In the category of collaborative practices, we grew 84 percentage points last year during remote learning. We still have a lot of work to do in the area of teacher-to-teacher -teacher trust and collective responsibility, but we have made great strides in collaborative practices and quality professional development. These are the things we've been able to do to support goal two. As of last year, about 25% of our staff had completed SEED training. But our leadership teams agreed that this was not sufficient, so last year in school year 21, we brought a five-part racial equity professional learning series to the school. To provide the training, we contracted with Corey Wallace, who has led much of the SEED training for the district. All teachers also complete a unit study at the beginning of each unit examining core standards and analyzing using a culturally responsive teaching protocol based on the work of Gloria Ladson Billings, which asks them to plan for implementation of the unit with an eye towards cultural responsiveness, academic achievement and rigor, as well as socio-political consciousness. We have been conscious to always disaggregate our data to watch for any signs of a developing achievement gap. So this graph, again, a little hard to read, but shows uh, is broken out among the uh, racial ethnic groups of Asian, black, African American, from, from left to right, Latinx, and white. Um, in, in the area of social emotional development, shown here, our students were demonstrating no significant di discrepancies across racial ethnic groups by the end of school year 21. In the area of literacy, again, our students were demonstrating no significant discrepancies by the end of school year 21, and I'd like to also point out how many students are in the exceeding expectations range, which is up in the blue. This is a big improvement from previous years. In the, er Oops. In the area of mathematics, again, there were no significant discrepancies noted by the end of school year 21. There was only slight variation, which we did examine to discern root causes and, put, and adjust our teaching um, plans for this year. For goal three, this is what we've been able to do. Oh, did I change it? I did not change that. Um, we have provided trauma-informed classrooms to the implementation of research-based programs such as conscious discipline and second steps. Conscious discipline strategies are used in the classroom for identity, uh, identity and community building as well as conflict resolution. Second step curriculum is used for the instruction of social emotional content, concepts. We've also been able to increase targeted MTSS support by our Panda Care team, our social workers and psychologists. This is how our students were faring in the area of social emotional development at the end of last year. In the objective, and, and this shows only the objectives we were able to measure during remote hybrid learning. Overall, students were meeting or exceeding widely held expectations with small percentages, less than 12% in every objective, falling in the below expectations range. This is how our current students performed at the end of our fall checkpoint period. So this is just uh, beginning of the year fall data um, after over the course of the first few months. Um, there are two major areas, of main areas of concern we are focusing on here. Objective 2D, making friends. These are the two areas that have the bigger pink bars. And 3B, solving social problems. Both of these objectives were unmeasurable last year when so many of our students were still in remote learning throughout the year, and both objectives they're both objectives that are negatively impacted by COVID health safety mitigation protocols that keep our students apart from one another. This is what we've been able to do to support strategic plan goal four. We have provided ongoing professional development, 
uh, to increase fidelity and practices of data collection and data analysis, driving a culture of data-informed instruction. We have provided ongoing professional learning and planning activities that have increased staff understanding of the teaching strategies, goals, objectives, and the Illinois Early Learning and Developmental Standards. We have provided supplemental curricula as needed to improve student outcomes through the use of programs such as the Haggerty Phonemic Awareness Curriculum. Improved resources support, uh, supporting the implementation of MTSS strategies, um, for example, the use of the Branching Minds platform, the development of an MTSS intervention menu, and the hiring of our academic skills tutors. Here is the begin our, here we see the map beginning of the year kindergarten literacy data for the past two years that the map assessment has been administered. The blue bars represent our class of school year 20. So these were kindergarten students in fall of school year 21. And the green bar represents our school year, our class of school year 21, kindergarten students in fall of 22. Despite the fact that there was a drop off between our alums of class of 20 to our alums of class of 21, Oh, I didn't tell, so thank you. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. I'm here, yeah. I d oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. There's two clickers. It's a problem. Um, all right. So I'll just say again, the green bars represent the students who were, um, well, the green bars are our current student or our most recent graduate school year uh, class of 21 who, start, who were in kindergarten beginning of 22, and the blue bars uh, represent the previous year's class, okay? Um, as you can see here that there is a slight drop off this year, in some cases more than slight. Um, but even these drop offs give us hope because the reduced numbers show strong improvement from the years prior to the enactment of the strategic strategic plan, where 30 37%, an average of 37% of our students were meeting literacy targets. We also noted that the data represented in green represents a school year during which two-thirds of our students were taught remotely all year and engagement issues were an ongoing struggle. The print concept area does remain a mystery to us. That's the center, the, the lower area. Um, it remains a mystery to us. Uh, one we have not been able to get clear, a clear answer on. We have questions because it has been consistently low for the past two years with no de definition of what is being measured. This domain is not present in the comparative graph I will show next, and there is no information about this section on the MAP Fluency Tech Report. It definitely does not correlate to the teaching strategies goal, that's the assessment we used in pre-K, concept of print objectives, where our students consistently score well by the end of the school year with over 80% meeting widely held expectations. Um, this, so this graph here, um, is the blue bars represent JEH students, uh, non-JEH students, I'm sorry, the blue bars represent non-JEH students with pre-K experience and the green bars represent our JEH alums. These da data are heartening as we are performing very closely with other students in the district, most of whom do not represent the risk factors that our students do. So for strategic plan goal five, these are the things we've been able to continue despite limitations presented by the pandemic. I won't pretend that COVID health safety protocols have not significantly hampered our abilities to have families involved in the day-to-day -day school life now that we are back in person. The ability to increase opportunities for family volunteerism has been a challenge due to COVID-19, but we were creative last year and many parents helped with the preparation of supply kits, which were distributed four times over the course of the year, but even more, volunteered in the classrooms every day when they logged their children in for remote learning and sat alongside them as they learned. This graph, uh, the following graphs are from the Five Essentials Parent Survey, and here you can see the difficulty we faced in parent volunteerism last year with 29% of our families indicating that they volunteered occasionally. 
and 50% answering that they volunteered never or rarely. None of them gave themselves credit for the daily volunteerism that they participated in by getting their students logged in and supporting their participation in school each day. Here, um, slightly more encouraging than volunteerism was the number of families who indicated that they occasionally to always attended school events with 77% of our families answering affirmatively. 88% of the, our families who completed the 5 E survey answered affirmatively that they always attend the parent-teacher conference, a very important touch point for families and teachers. Okay, and strategic plan goal six. Oops, what did I do? There it is. Um, listed here are the things that we have done and still are in the act of doing to align resources in order to best support student growth and successful outcomes. I want to also speak here to some of the challenges we have faced in this area. What has been hard to manage over the past almost two years has been the significant amount of administrative time that has gone into ensuring basic systems and operations are functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. First, we were reinventing what early childhood education looked like in the virtual world. Now we are back in person most of the time. There are still rolling classroom closures for quarantine. And due to higher than typical staff absenteeism and a substitute shortage, an incredible amount of administrative and support staff capacity has gone into ensuring that classrooms were covered and staffed according to legal early childhood ratios. Due to the pandemic-related stress, a very large amount of human resources have gone into helping keep everyone connected, emotionally supported, and cohesive as a group, as a team. COVID has done everything in its power to keep us isolated, and it has taken a very concerted effort to keep us connected and whole through it all. In summary, two and a half years after initial implementation of a three-year strategic plan, both preschool TS Gold data and the kindergarten map literacy data indicate that we are providing significantly, significantly improved outcomes for our JEH alums. The five essentials data is showing that we are moving towards being organized for continuous improvement. Did I? Oh, no. Uh, for continuous improvement. And despite operational and system setbacks brought on by a global pandemic, we are moving in the right direction and need to maintain focus to continue this growth. I want to thank the entire JEH community for all of their hard work and support in implementing the strategic plan. We have made great progress despite challenges of historical proportions, and I am extremely proud of the team we have built and the progress our students have made through it all. Thank you. I think we may have a couple of questions. Of course. Um, one, I, as well as some folks who are here tonight, were a part of the initial early childhood task force that helped to uh, lead to this lovely strategic plan. And it is um, encouraging to see that gap closing between um, our JEH alum and folks who are attending private preschools throughout our community. Um, I, these disaggregated data wasn't in the memo. Um, and so I appreciate you including the racially disaggregated data here. Um, one of the outcomes last year that we were hoping to see movement in were, were our outcomes for our Latinx um, young people. And from what you shared today, there are indicators that there are not um, measurable gaps between how our Latinx students are performing and TS Gold versus um, their peers. And I was just wondering if you could speak to us a little bit more about the investments that you all made into helping to bring parity 
in in those outcomes. Okay, I'm really happy to brag on my bilingual teaching team. <laughs> they had to stare at some pretty um, disconcerting data last year this time, and it was a real call to action, and they answered the call. They came together, they worked collaboratively as a team, they really looked at the data and analyzed where the students were falling behind, particularly in mathematics, um, areas of quantifying, and they developed a plan, they worked together, and they really targeted their instruction around these areas, and they saw the outcomes. They engaged in progress monitoring, supported one another, observed one another, the TLC process was really operating strongly, and we saw the outcomes, right? So it was really an incredible example of how data-informed instruction can improve outcomes for students. So I'm very proud of that team. Um, th again, this year we're seeing some discrepancies in the fall data, and they are ready to go to work. They've already started. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's really um, exciting and encouraging and much gratitude to that team. Mm -hmm. And so please share that we are proud and appreciative of them and the investment that they've made. And I hope that that work can also be a model for how we continue to tackle any discrepancies that show up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the other wondering I have is about data, and I'm not sure that you're going to be able to answer that. Um, but for the kindergarten outcomes, it's not disaggregated by race. And so one of our, I think, deepest hopes with the uh, Early Childhood Task Force was that we really disrupt um, gaps in opportunity to achieve mm -hmm. by investing in early, early childhood opportunities for um, vulnerable populations. And so, you know, this kindergarten readiness question is really critical specifically for our vulnerable communities. And I know given that JEH primarily serves vulnerable communities, in some ways we can presume that these are all um, growth metrics for folks from vulnerable backgrounds, but it would be helpful to see it, how alumni are doing by race and ethnicity. Is that something that's possible for us to get? Is that something that you can promise or not? I imagine. I could certainly ask them, uh, ask Brad to disaggregate that way for us um, in that. They, it's not something that has been offered up to me. That I shared with you what, what has been shared with me. But we could definitely ask for that. I agree with you. It would be of interest to see. And we do know that our population is approximately, you know, very slightly year to year, but 75 to 80 percent students of color. Um, so you can sort of extrapolate a little bit when comparing it to the rest of the district, but um, I think it's a great idea. I'll ask for it. Thank you. Yes, Lynn. I, did, I just wanted to get a comment and then a question. Um, but again, I just want to thank you for all the work, incredible work that you're doing, doing in JH and all the team. Uh, again, those are our littles uh, from, our, from our most marginalized communities. I think, you know, a lot of the equity work really sits, uh, or, or the foundation is set here at JEH, right? And, and I think uh, you're setting a this precedent, right, for the rest of the district uh, in regards to, and then again, I was part of that group, the Early Childhood Task Force, and, and just, uh, uh, just seeing this data, and, and despite the pandemic, um, seeing the progress is just absolutely phenomenal. I mean, it's incredible. Um, so, so kudos, and you know, share this with the, you know, share this video with with your staff. I mean, I think that they're doing an exceptional job. They've seen uh, it, and I would love to see, you know, again, the example that you gave here in regards to, you know, presenting not just academic and cognitive development, but also literacy and then parent involvement and parent engagement. You, you give us this comprehensive report and picture of how school districts, when all puzzle pieces are working together, can really move the needle and, and, uh, on equity. Uh, so, so again, uh, to me, you know, I'd love to see this type of reporting of what, like, what you did today, 
across the, 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 our whole system all the way up to eighth grade. Uh, um, and um, so now seeing that and then taking it, a, so my question is, um, you know, if I was thinking about the kids assessments, the kindergarten individual development survey. So, you know, as we think about comparing apples to apples and, and really taking this comprehensive look at how children develop, uh, you know, the, for me, uh, you know, kids is kind of this, this natural continuation of how early childhood should be, which I think continues on till second, third grade. Uh, uh, so, you know, for, you know, for me, kids kind of co continues what teaching strategy goals, teaching strategy goals does and really takes that comprehensive look at ch child development from a cognitive, social, emotional uh, perspective. Uh, so, you know, my hope is that uh, I know, um, you know, JEH has done collaborations and has done work with our kindergarten teachers. I know you've, have, you've had your meetings annually. I don't know if it happened because of COVID last year, but uh, again, uh, you're hoping that can continue to happen in regards to, because I think that's also part of the piece is, is making sure that we have these transitions for, from our early childhood system or early childhood uh, program here to our, 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 our K, K-8 uh, schools. Uh, as smooth as possible where everybody's understanding where kids are at and, and where we want them to go. Um, so, so for me, one of those pieces would be having a conversation around the kids assessment and how, again, some of those domains, and maybe we can think of more domains on that particular assessment or survey, uh, which is an observational survey, um, can really kind of help us continue to connect the dots and create this, uh, help continue helping us move the needle uh, for our most marginalized students that emerge out of JEH. So, so that's um, the question is can we, can we do, can we look at kids, kids survey data next year? Um, so. I, think, I think we can't look, I mean the, the, ki the, p the challenges we face with kids um, ha have to do with the fact that the data comes in so late. I mean I, the, the district would have to really commit to using the kids survey in full at the kindergarten level in order to make it terribly useful for us because in the way we use it now, we only use part of the assessment, so we don't get the result because of that, we don't get the data back for till much later in the year. So it's not really usable to teachers. I think that the, I mean, I don't work with kindergarten, but I, um, I, I know that if you collect all of that documentation in order to conduct the kids survey, which is very similar to teaching strategies goals um, assessment, as you said. That process unto itself is incredibly valuable for an educator. So I think it is a great process for the educators to go through at the beginning of the year. But it is unfortunate that they, they don't get any meaningful results back until much later. Um, but it, you know, there, there are, I know that Dr. Beardsley has been discussing um, possibilities of with some of the kindergarten educators of expanding the use of kids more fully that would bring into play some questions about how they're going to have enough coverage to actually influence <coughs> it because it is a large assessment and, and that one teacher trying to do the whole thing could be challenging but I'll leave that <laughs> for you to sort out but I, I agree it is you know definitely it's there's more correlation in terms of the type of assessment holistic assessment between kids and teaching strategies goals. Thank you. Um, at the risk of being repetitive, I, I think this work often is slow and we don't get to always celebrate victories. So I'm gonna take another moment to acknowledge three things that you identified that I'm particularly excited about. Uh, that our data is still better than it was before we started all of this during a pandemic is exceptional, right? I mean, we never want to see the numbers go down, but it, they, should have, they should have gone down far more considering what we were struggling with and how many additional layers of challenges this population has at their age. Um, and with the pandemic, I think the fact that we are closing the gap on other programs, I mean, this is a, a huge issue that we were trying to address over the last several years as making sure that our, our, the kids in our programs were going into our schools as ready as any other kids in town. Um, and the fact that that gap is closing, and then I, I appreciate Anya bringing, because I was looking through it and going, I remember us talking about trying to understand the disparity for Latinx students and the fact that that gap is also closing 
just uh, all of that really please celebrate with your staff um, that this is just exceptional work and I hope that we can steal lots of ideas and uh, generalize it across our entire system because we this is this is phenomenal work you all are doing so thank you yeah I just wanted to know on top of that that um, one of the other things that came up a lot when we were doing the early childhood task force was how foundational JEH is for how vulnerable families get introduced to District 65 and how their expectations get set about how they should be treated, how their school should feel for them and for their children, and um, seeing the levels of engagement, but also hearing you mention the way that you notice that parents are engaged but maybe haven't given themselves credit for um, is, I think, really meaningful in terms of the affirmative and empowered experience that I hope all of our caregivers have in throughout District 65, but it's just a really powerful way to enter into the school system with really high standards, regardless of your vulnerabilities. And um, that's critical because we know our, our, all of our kids' first educator is their, their caregivers. And so those caregivers feeling empowered and connected and valued is critical to the rest of the experience with District 65. So thank you all for paying close attention to that and thinking of the affirmative ways to engage with our families. Um, I also wanted to hear a little bit more. You mentioned academic skill centers at JH. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like it looks a little different. At JH. <laughs> I hope so, but we'd like to hear a little bit it's more like about it's that. Play-based, right? <laughs> uh, we have four. Well, we have four tutor positions, but only three, three filled right now, one in the process of being filled, uh, the, the fourth in the process of being filled. Um, and we, use, uh, we don't have a center that we pull students out to, uh, to go to. The, the, uh, our tutors help, uh, they work with the teachers, they go to regular um, MTSS cohort meetings, so with smaller groups of teachers, the tutors are checking in regularly to see how the students are doing and they're developing intervention plans together. They're helping to execute on these intervention plans. They're focusing more on the academic skills and our Panda care team, which is our psychologists and our uh, social workers, are focusing more on any interventions that might in, uh, be around social emotional learning. Um, but they are out, th they're pushing into classrooms, they're working just outside the classrooms, they're really, uh, um, doing a lovely job developing relationships with the students and working with the teachers to uh, develop strategies that they can reinforce with the students when they're working with them. So it's been a nice addition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's really great to hear and um, honestly it's, we have not been able to I think operate those kind of integrated systems with fidelity often um, in District 65 and so it's really wonderful to hear how you all are working collaboratively with uh, fidelity to I think how those uh, supplements were imagined and I really um, want to acknowledge and congratulate the team on being flexible and adaptive. Um, <laughs> This, this pandemic has required us to be, all to be flexible to uh, points that we probably never imagined that certainly introduce a lot of stress. And um, it sounds like the team is really taking that on with grace and compassion for children and families and one another. And so thank you all for that. I think you said it perfectly, grace and compassion and dedication. It's been, they've been amazing, really. Um, and, and it has been challenging, as everybody knows, for teachers everywhere across the country. Um, but I'm very proud of our team, I really am. Thank you. Thank you, and we're proud of you all as well. I think I think okay. that has exhausted <laughs> all the questions and comments from the board. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Very much. So we had some really informative uh, FYI 
items that we encourage folks to pay attention to and um, specifically the opening of schools and uh, fall housing data. And um, with that, with no further business before the board, I adjourn this meeting at 8.34 p.m. <laughs>